Among all the subjects we have a hard time talking about, whether at home or at church, is sex. But according to a new book, churches need to talk about sexuality. Mark Wingfield, the associate pastor at Wilshire Baptist Church in Dallas, has written this book, and he urges just such a conversation. Stay tuned for Good God. Welcome to Good God, conversations that matter about faith and public life. I'm your host, George Mason, and I'm so pleased to welcome to the program today my friend and colleague, Mark Wingfield. Thank you. We serve together at Wilshire Baptist Church. Uh, Mark is our associate pastor and uh, leader of our staff and programs and communications and all those sorts of things, a career journalist yes. uh, before becoming a church staff minister. And he is the recent author of this book, Why Churches Need to Talk About Sexuality, Lessons Learned from Hard Conversations About Sex, Gender, G gender Identity, and the Bible. That's a mouthful, Mark. Yes. Uh, it is, a, 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 however, a really important subject, one that was not gained uh, through theoretical knowledge. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> we both have the scars to prove <laughs> we it. We <laughs> really do, don't we? So uh, while we're laughing about that, because thank God now we can laugh a bit, we uh, had so many tears and anguished times uh -huh. in working through this matter with our congregation. Yeah. Um, the hardest thing I think uh, you would say you've ever done, Absolutely. certainly the hardest thing I've ever done in ministry, uh, and it uh, a lot of times hard things are good things. Yes. And in this case, that was certainly true. Uh, but uh, in 2016, our church uh, culminated a uh, lengthy study uh, that led to a decision to uh, be fully inclusive in our membership of uh, all members, including those with same-sex orientation and uh, gender identity that would be outside of the, the norm. And so we... Um, we made that decision. It had great consequences uh, for some people who left and for others who came. Yes. Uh, but uh, during that time in that study, Mark, you sat there with your computer open yes. and you wrote and wrote and wrote, chronicling uh, in detail how all of this took place. And as is your want, you decided that this was really an important subject for others to understand. And because you're a writer, you banged this out. I say banged it out. Yep. Uh, there's plenty of editing that goes after, after writing. Yeah. Uh, but one of the things you really cared most deeply about in producing a book like this is that you, you just believe that churches, as the title says, need to talk about sexuality. Yeah. So the original title that I gave it was Have the Conversation Anyway. Anyway, yes. And uh, this is the title we ended up with, which is good. But the main point I want to make is that churches need to have the con It's a painful conversation. It is yes. difficult, but it's so important because most churches in America are avoiding this conversation like the plague because right. it, there's so much fear around yes. it. And I think we would both say that, yes, it's difficult. It's mm -hmm. the hardest thing we've ever done. But there's no way we would go back and say we wouldn't do it again. Yes, right. That's absolutely right. The, the experiences we have had of seeing people's uh, faith uh, restored, uh, their emotions healed, yeah. their uh, sense of social um, welcome in uh, places associated with pain for them, uh, it, there's no substitute for the the beauty of that, and there was only uh, one way to get there. And, and I had difficult. no idea the amount of pain that was there. Yes. I really, I right. thought I understood that. Right. I did not understand it. I don't think either of us understood the extent of the pain in the LGBTQ community, but among people who are people of faith, Yes. who have felt rejected by their childhood church, by their family, by their friends, and the very voice of God, and, mm -hmm. and to then have a church that says, God loves you as you are, is so much more radical than we ever imagined. Yes, and, and I, I, I hasten to say that while it was painful for us to go through this, uh, it, I often think there, 
there is no way that we can even begin to imagine the level of pain. What we tasted only was a fraction of what many LGBTQ folk have felt at the hands of the yes. church for on, on an everyday basis for their entire lives. That's right. And so we went through momentary affliction, you might say, yes. in, in, in being allies in, in this cause. Uh, but w if, if they have any measure of the joy we have, right, as a result of it, yeah. uh, it's really a, a, a great um, uh, and, and beautiful story at the end. It is, so. and one of the things that I write about in the book that was a surprise, I think, to us was we opened our doors after the vote and after the study process, and we expected people just to come and join. <laughs> and what we found is that people came and lurked they and did. watched. And it was not enough for us to say you're welcome. Yes. We had to prove that you were welcome. Yeah. And that took six, nine, 12 months or longer for people to say, we're here to see if you really are who you say you are. Yes, that's that's absolutely right. And, uh, and, and it was... Um, it was a little uncomfortable, I think, for many of our folks when uh, you and I, in the various forums we have, I in pulpit and you with pen and other ways, and uh, to continue to reinforce the decision the church made and the and the 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 lack of limitations being placed on LGBTQ right. folk. Uh, I I think people were so tired, uh, you know, for after a couple of years of working through this, they would just have preferred that we, you know, just sort of move on. And, and, and what we found was that these people who were coming to us really needed to hear that we were not embarrassed or didn't right. regret this decision, that they were really, really welcome. Because, you know, many churches uh, say that everybody's welcome, but then there's kind of a subtext that they didn't know and, and yeah. they were, they're looking for. So it, it was quite a, an experience. Well, and the other part of that is, I think w our anticipation was that we could make this decision, not publicize it, yes. just let word of mouth take its course. Right. And instead, we got thrown under the bus by some other uh, folks who wanted to make an issue out of it outside right. the church. Yeah. And it was the greatest favor they ever could have done us, but right. we just didn't know it at the time. The it's, publicity, it's true. what they intended for evil, God intended <laughs> for good. Well, and let's not make them evil, though. I, I, I understand your point. Uh, I, you know, a lot of the folks who left, the people who were deeply disappointed in what we did and who continue to right. feel uh, let down by their long association with us and, and whatnot, you know, I, you know, I always try to give them the benefit of the doubt, too, and say, you know, they were doing what they believed is right and what, you know, and, and maybe I wish they did it differently sometimes and that kind of thing. Uh, but in the end, uh, change is, is painful and it's difficult and it, it, people make decisions as a result of it. And here we yeah, are. Yeah, and you're, you're right about that. There are good people involved. Yes. Uh, absolutely. The, the interesting point about that is that there were people outside the system yes. who became players in the system yes. in trying to force an issue for us. And that's detailed in the book, too, yes. how others uh, got so upset on the behalf of us when they weren't even part of the church. Right, right, right. So uh, among the things that surprised me in this process was just how few people changed their mind. Mm. Um, you know, I, I, I read a book by a moral philosopher recently, uh, Jonathan Haidt, uh, called The Righteous Mind, in which he talks about how, um, you know, ideas are just um, the rider on the elephant, is what, the way he puts it. And, uh, and sometimes we have a tendency to think, if I, if I just get the right information, I can change my mind and all of that, but the, the elephant, the, is is the one that's operating instinctively and is most in control of most people's uh, decision making, and I think that was true in our experience where we we actually thought we'd study and we'd pray and yeah. we'd talk and all of that, and um, and people would maybe change their mind and really what we found is they'd already made their decisions for the most part. We were actually. Um, perceiving that the congregation had changed over time, and we were right, but it it still didn't right. It, it was surprising. So, a, as a journalist and as a someone who thinks in a certain way, it's always my hope that if we just give people enough information, yes, they'll come to the same decision that I would come to. Right? right. Logically, this yes. is what happens, and yet 
the one thing I think we did discover is that a lot of folks who were wanting to be inclusive yes. didn't know how to express that. I think that's and right. And so uh, one of the things I note in the book is, it, it, and this drives traditionalists crazy, mm-hmm. when someone who's more inclusive says, uh, well, I don't, I can't explain why, but I just feel in my heart that it's the right thing to do. Right. And that's not enough, right? right. But yet we were able, I think through the study, to mm-hmm. give some of those folks some language to put around what they right. thought but had never been able to articulate. So yes. we, ha- we helped them express what they thought to be right, but they gave some more concrete thought to it. And the same was probably true on the other side mm-hmm. with some folks who were opposed and were able to read our work and the, the study group's reports and say, yeah, this is why I believe it's wrong. Right. Right. So uh, it clarified, I suppose, and more or less deepened people's positions, perhaps more than it changed them. Uh, but um, what's been the response so far to your book? Well, the response has been uh, tremendous, and uh-huh. I'm very excited about it, and thankful to Fortress Press uh, for putting it out there. We've gone into a second printing this week, and uh, uh, the the thing that I've heard most from people is they, two things I've heard so far, they're surprised that it's a narrative. Uh-huh. So what I do in the book is I just tell our story yes. along with some advice and tips learned along the way, and they're, they're appendices with resources. But it really is a narrative story from right. beginning to end about what happened. And then the second thing people say is, I, I just can't believe the amount of pain that's in this book, right. uh, the conflict that you went through. And uh, I'll say when I went back and wrote the book a year and a half to two years after the events uh, and reading through all the minutes of the meetings, I had forgotten Right. I had repressed in my own head how painful some of that was because it's just too unpleasant. Uh, and this this is in what we like to call a healthy church. I know. So I get why pastors are afraid. I, I mean, it was hard for me to read the book. You know, I, I mean, of course, I read drafts along right. the way. And, oh, it was just, oh, yes, I know. Oh, that's right. And, boy, I wish I didn't have to think about that again. Yes. Right. You right. just for, you, you, you set aside some of that. Right, right. Uh, I have one of the members of the study uh, group who's just reading the book this week and is live texting me as, as while reading. With, oh, really? With comments, you know, like, oh, my, I'd forgotten about that. Yes, right, right. right. And I think we're all in that boat. Right. So we've also had quite an experience, and I know you have, I have as well, with uh, churches and other pastors and ministers calling yeah. on us to say, help me uh, with this. And we're hoping this is one of the ways we can help because it's hard, obviously, when almost every week we get a call right. from somebody saying, can you take me through this? Well, please read the book. Right, you know, and that's, before, that's you know. exactly the, one of the primary yeah. reasons I wrote the book was yeah. together, you and I, yes. there's hardly a week goes by that we're not getting a it's call true. from a pastor or a lay leader or an email saying, I hear this happened to you, right. tell me what you did, right. and it's much easier to say, okay, here, here's the story, read this, and then let's talk. Exactly, right. And, and we, are, we are seeing some remarkable similar stories take place, I hope with less pain, but often equally yes. so, and we, we don't ever overpromise, do we? I mean, we, we, we tell people that this is the hard thing but a good thing, expect certain things, uh, but uh, some of my most uh, rewarding experiences have been when pastors have called me back or written mm. me back and said, you know what, thank you for your help. Our church has made it. We've, we've gone through it. We're going to be okay. And it, it's, uh, it's really rewarding, isn't it? I think one of the things we've had to acknowledge is that Wilshire is exceptionally blessed in many ways, we're the exception to the rule. Yes. With yes, we had losses. Yes, mm-hmm. we had pain. Right. But not nearly at the level many of our colleagues have had. Yes. Uh, and yet, when I talk to them, even some folks who were eighteen months to two years ahead of us in the process, mm-hmm. from much more conservative starting places yes. than we were, to a person, they will tell you, "I would not do it any differently today if I had to do it over again." Well, we might have done certain steps differently, but even that's hard to know. It just is what it is. You, that, I would not have not done this. That's I, the I point. Wouldn't, I wouldn't that's not right. do the thing. That, that's right. exactly right. Yeah. And, you know, I think one of the things that we try to acknowledge also is that here in Dallas, Texas, while it was unusual for a church our size in the Baptist tradition to do what we did, Uh, There are other Baptist churches, there are other churches of the Christian faith, uh, 
that had gone through this before us right. and were deeply encouraging to us uh, along the way. Yeah, we were not the first. That's, That's important right. to say. It uh, is. We were not the first. Mm -hmm. We may have been the most prominent yeah. uh, to date to go through this process. But we also have a, as, as you've said before, um, a, a public profile disproportionate to our size. Yes, yes, that that's people are watching right. what we're doing. It is, it is an interesting thing. Well, uh, when we get come back, I'd like to talk a little more about the L G B and especially the T. Sure. Uh, because I think uh, that's been a special uh, work and ministry that you've had as well. So uh, we're going to take a break and come right back. Thank you for continuing to tune in to Good God. This program is made possible by the contributions of friends of the program, and we are delighted that they continue to support it so generously so that we don't have to ask for additional support every episode. I'm sure you're glad about that too. If you'd like to know where else you can tune in to find Good God, whether in a video format or audio, or even to get a transcript of the program, go to www goodgodproject.com. That's our website, and it's the best place to go to receive an archive of all the previous episodes and to get a new one each week if you'd like. Thanks again for your support. We're back with Mark Wingfield, author of Why Churches Need to Talk About Sexuality. Uh, Fortress Press, available at all the places you get your books, uh, yes. Amazon certainly. Uh, and so uh, I do recommend it. How much is it, by the way? $17. $17, the best Bargain. $17 you'll yes. uh, spend. Uh, well, Mark, um, one of the surprising things that happened through this whole process <laughs> was we were sitting in the study group meeting and uh, the question came up, okay, we're talking about same-sex orientation. Mm -hmm. There's also that gender identity question. Right. And uh, we ended up having, uh, sitting in our group, a pediatrician and a genetics counselor. And they just decided to take over the, the grease board and give us a lesson. Yes. And it was eye-opening, wasn't it? It was. I will never forget that day. I can, I can envision yeah. it to this moment, <laughs> that whiteboard and the writing that was up there. And I remember sitting there listening to this presentation on chromosomes and genetics and brain cells and anatomy and all these different things that have to line up in the way that we normally expect them to line up. And I sat there and thought to myself, you know, I'm a relatively well-educated person. Mm -hmm. I've been around a bit. Yes. Why did I not know this before? Why is this new information? I mean, this is mind-blowing. Yes. And three days after that, I, I just continued to think about it. I couldn't get it out of my head. And I had this nudge, uh, that I needed to write down what I had learned. Because as a columnist for a, a national news service, I had this opportunity. It wasn't my week to write. It was not the time I should have been writing, but I, I, I just felt compelled. And I sat down and wrote this column in 45 minutes called wow. Seven Things I'm Learning About Transgender Persons. And I ran it by a couple of people who helped me polish you know, some of the terminology along the way. And by the next Friday morning, it was published. Uh, online, and I knew something was different that morning when I woke up and it had been published for an hour and a half, and my phone was blowing up. Uh, Facebook messages, emails, text messages, and what happened over that weekend was it went viral in a way I never understood, and that column has been read by more than a million people uh, now, and it opened doors. Uh, one of the things I said in the column was, I don't know any transgender persons, but I want to learn. And uh, <laughs> all these people began reaching out to me within hours saying, I'll be your transgender friend. Right. And I began sitting down. I had breakfast and lunch and dinner and coffee with wonderful people who sat down and just poured their hearts out to me and told me their stories, who they were, what they'd been through. And I listened. I just sat and listened, and I've never been the same. I want to follow the trail in just a moment of where that took you, but I think it's probably an important thing at this moment to stop and just define terms a little sure. bit. So when we say transgender, at the root of that is the reality that most people are born with a clear sense of being male or female. Right. While there may be some continuum uh, in some sense, most people 
in most people, three things line up. Uh, one is their presenting anatomy. Right. Uh, two is their chromosomes. Right. Uh, and three is what we've come now to learn is that the appropriate male or female brain, right. which is a relatively new concept. The truth is that for slightly less than 1% of the population, only it is, is our best guess, right? Yeah. Um, those three things do not all line up. And what's tragically so is because often they are hidden that's realities, right. whether in the brain or yeah. uh, sometimes even anatomy uh, with internal testes or yes. internal uh, ovaries. ovaries. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we, don't, we don't know that without testing and that sort of thing. Or actually um, chromosomes that uh, don't correspond to, exactly. uh, to our anatomy. For that small group of the population, there is this sense of something is wrong with me in terms of my gender. Now that's not sexuality, and I think it's important right. to distinguish, right? Gender and sexuality are not the same thing. Uh, sexuality is what you do and whom you love and how, right. but g gender is an identity who, who you, you are. are right? uh, but this was some of the big information we learned yes. through this process. right? And so uh, recognizing this then is that uh, we can't simply say, oh, somebody just isn't content Right. Uh, they're, they're just not, well, they're not content for a reason, right? They don't feel like themselves in their body, right? That's, that's exactly right. A every transgender person I've ever talked to, and that is hundreds, by the way, yes. at this point, to a person they told me, I, I knew when I was four or five or six years old that who yes. I was on the inside did not match who I appeared to be on the outside. Right. You, no one would make this up. Yes. I, I, no one would want to suffer right. the disconnect that what's now labeled as gender dysphoria is a very painful condition yes. uh, emotionally. Uh, it's not a mental illness. Right. It is a recognized condition where these things you're talking about don't line up and it creates internal conflict. Mm -hmm. And there is a way to address that mm -hmm. uh, uh, through hormone therapy and through uh, being able to be authentic in yourself. But it goes all the way back to early childhood. Well, there's, there's a lot of controversy about this, obviously, because the more information we have and the more public transgender persons yeah. are willing to be, the more stories there are. And for people of traditional values, often Christian people who want to have clarity about sexuality in a traditional way, who want clarity about gender identity, you're either male or female, uh, this is a deeply troubling movement that it's become more publicly known. And so we start seeing stories, don't we, about um, the family where the mother and father disagree and where the right. one wants the child to be what the child was at birth and all of that. And then there's an accusation that the mother actually wants a child to have surgery and hormones and all of that at six years old or some such thing, eight years old. And that's not what happens. That is not, absolutely. And it, I think it's important for you to say, how does this work? Yeah, it's really important to understand, no one in yeah. the accepted medical community yes. is doing transgender or gender affirmation surgery on a six-year-old. That's right. At, at all, it does right. not happen. That would be horrible. Uh, what happens is uh, doctors will work with a child through puberty. Yes. Uh, they've got to get through puberty Not first. before puberty. Not before puberty, and even even then, even then, it's sometimes years, and there's generally a big majority about age, this, right? Yes, that's right. A big debate about this, even in the transgender community. Mm -hmm. But what parents will allow their kids to do, and I think this is acceptable, is to present the gender right. that they believe themselves to be. Right. And I know some people say, "Well, isn't that just a fad? Maybe they'll, you know, mm -hmm. like I like green today." Yes. No, it's much more deeply felt than that, and the number of cases that I know of where a child is allowed to present uh, in a different gender who then comes back and says, ah, just kidding, uh, that's not happening. No, and you know, w one of our colleagues uh, has a transgender child uh, who um, while living as a boy was sullen, isolated, yeah. uh, depressed, and when finally they allowed him to live into a, a, a female identity, 
uh, our friend says she skips everywhere. Yes. She is full of life all of a sudden. It's absolutely astonishing the change of personality that happens when someone can live into an identity that they believe is really God given to them. And, and I think this brings us to the question, Mark, where is God in this, right? Because a lot of people think, I, I think without thinking deeply about it, that God specifically designs every person exactly and perfectly right yeah. when they come out. We don't think that way about a hair lip. We don't think that way about right. um, other sorts of um, factors. Uh, why should this be any different, right? Well, I think uh, one of our other colleagues uh, has a child who's autistic. Yes. And walking that road with that child has opened his eyes in a new way yes. to the whole issue of sexual orientation and gender identity. Yes, right. To say, my child didn't choose to be autistic. Right. Uh, right. The, whatever these things are. And so, uh, where is God in this? Where is God in any yes. of the rest of the world, right. some of us just take so much for grant, granted that the way we are is the way the world is. Right. right. And, and we now know that's not true if you pay attention. Mm -hmm. uh, we were talking earlier about the, the theology of the, the, the biblical text uh, yes. in, the, in the Hebrew scriptures uh, about night and day and male and female, not right. male or female and right. so forth. Uh, and the most helpful description that I've come up with is to say we believe that God created day, daylight and dark, night and day. Yes. But we also know dawn and dusk. That's right. Uh, within the ra range of that. And yet right. Genesis doesn't say, and God created dawn and dusk. That's right. But we believe God did. Yes, right? very good. So uh, we also know that there are a lot of uh, human factors at play here. Mm -hmm. There are chemicals in the water, in the air that have caused, there's medicines that were given to moms in the 50s and 60s that had an influence on this. There are genetic things at play that we don't really understand right. yet. If we believe that God is the creator of all, yes. then we've got to believe God is the creator of all. We yes. can't believe that God is the creator of just some. Yes, very good. So every body, every body. is one of the themes of our church, and we like to separate those two words in a sense to right. emphasize that bodies are important to God too. Yes. Uh, but let me take, take the listeners a little bit on a journey with you that also includes your having done a TED Talk about right. this and become a, a, a real advocate, uh, sort of the accidental, uh, tr you know, uh, transgender whisperer of a minister. Oh, how unlikely, Mark, right? right. Okay, and yet this has become a, a real passion for you and a, a, a a ministry that you haven't asked for but have responded to, and it's been deeply rewarding. Uh, yeah, it's very hard to talk about it without being very teary. Yes. Because uh, the, the the transgender friends and the family members of the trans friends that I have are, uh, it, it's a real privilege to be able to represent and be, speak on, on their behalf. And this is not, this is not my issue. It's it's someone mm -hmm. else's life, mm -hmm. right? And yet I get to have the privilege of speaking because. I am heard, mm -hmm. am able to be heard. It's the ultimate privilege uh, in a way. I, I'm reminded of this experience that we had uh, the summer before our vote. Mm -hmm. If you recall, we were in Greensboro, North Carolina. Oh my. At the uh, CBF what a moment. Uh, meeting, mm -hmm. and there was an offsite meeting mm -hmm. for uh, churches that were dealing with these issues. Mm -hmm. And th this church had. Um, gotten, uh, <laughs> had taken a turn 16 years before because they ordained a gay deacon. Right. And if you were, we, you talked, I talked, others talked, and uh, there was a Q&A, and &A, and then toward the end, this man walked in from the side who we had never seen before. Well, he was actually working the sound. Oh, he was the sound he, man, he right. He was, at, from the church. And so he, yeah. he came in, and the pastor who was presiding handed him the microphone, and I right. sat there and thought, who is this man, and why is he getting the microphone? Right. What is happening here, right? And the man stood up and said, um, I am the gay deacon who was ordained here 16 years ago. Right. I have one thing to say to you all. Thank you for what you're doing. You will save more lives than you will lose church members. And then he handed the microphone and left. Yep. And that made an indelible impression on me. And what motivates me in the work with the trans community is saving lives. The suicide rate among the transgender community yes. is 43%. Wow. Let it that sink in. 43%. Nearly half. Nearly half. 
Yes. So uh, if, if we're pro-life <laughs> mm-hmm. and we believe God wants people to live, right. then we need to address this issue. Yes, it's mm-hmm. a small, relatively percent of the population, there's a lot of people yes. still. And if the church cannot speak on their behalf, if we can't speak on their behalf to say God loves you as you are, and God has made you as you are, uh, we, we, are, we, are, we are letting half them die. Well, and we're letting ourselves, um, well, let me put it this way. As, as ministers and as a church, we are missing out on their presence. Oh, absolutely. And their gifts and yeah. what they have to offer. I think this is something that we, people fail to see. Um, people of same-sex orientation and, and uh, gender dysphoria who come to us, they are created in the image and likeness of God every bit as much as we. And as professing Christians who come to be part of the church, they have been given spiritual gifts for the sake of the, the body. The, the church is richer with them and poorer without them. It is not simply a, a gesture on the part of the, the community to say, we'll let you be here. Oh, right. It is really transformative for the community that we now have access to the strengths and gifts and love and compassion and, and, and passion for, uh, for others that they bring to us. And uh, you know, Mark, I think uh, about the work that you've done, the book that you've written, uh, it's not about us, but as Martin Luther King Jr. said during the Civil Rights era, uh, until those who are um, not personally affected become as committed to the cause mm. as those who are, yeah. uh, things will not change the way they should. I'm paraphrasing him, of course, and uh, I think this is part of what the role of an ally is. Thank you for being a good sure. ally. Thank you for being a good steward of oh. your gifts. Mm-hmm. And again, why churches need to talk about sexuality. Mark Wingfield. Thanks. Thanks. Good.